Good to have you all. Uh, just a word of warning. Uh, this message is a bit difficult to give because it is absolutely, a, this is Daniel chapter 11, is an absolute volume of information. Uh, and as you'll see in a minute, it, it's hard to get it all out and have it make sense. So I spent a, just an unusual amount of time deciphering everything that this uh, chapter has. And so I'm just going to encourage you, grab your notes page in your bulletin, and here's why. I'm going to give you a lot of names, faces, places, dates. And to be honest, I really don't expect you to remember them. And to be quite honest, it's not necessary to. I'm just going to, as we go, I don't generally teach verse by verse. That's not my preference. But there's no way around it in this because of all that's happening in the book. So just bear with me. We're only going to do the first 20 verses. I can't go any farther. That would run. We'd be here about three hours if I tried to do the whole chapter. And you would not like that. Uh, so just what I really want you to remember are the fill in the blanks that I have for those. Those are the really, I think, the keys to understanding this and the points of truth that I think will come out. So I just want to give you a heads up on that. How many of you know Easter comes earlier this year? It's moved up to April 4th, and I just want to, I don't know if we've got this information out yet because we were just beginning to work on this. I really, as I prayed for Easter, uh, I really felt like we needed to up our game this year. Even with everything going on and COVID and all that. And so the staff sat and we, we had a great discussion. And so let me just give you the highlights of what we're going to do. We're going to have an Easter week, not an Easter day. And so, well, thank you. Um, and back in the day, there, there was something that was celebrated and it's gotten lost over the time. It's called Maundy Thursday. Does, some of you all remember that? Probably just a couple of you, maybe a lot because it's not taught. It's part of church history. But that's really commemorating the night that Jesus was officially handed over. And that's, that's that Thursday before the Sunday. So we're going to have an event that night. Um, we're going to have, um, and if I get these wrong, <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, all the things we're going to do. We're going to have a Monday, ser Monday Thursday service. Just kind of a brief service in here. We're going to take communion together. I just could do maybe 15 or 20 minutes on the meaning of that day. And then... Uh, this will get sent out to you. We're going to do a, a dinner together. And um, we're going to cater in a dinner, but it'll be something you have to register for because of social distancing and that. So uh, that is something I think will be a lot of fun, just to have Monday, Thursday, and then a, a special catered dinner for those who want to come and just experience that opportunity. Then Friday night, the, the, the night, the night Jesus, the afternoon that Jesus was crucified, uh, we're going to show the controversial film, The Passion of the Christ. Now, I know it's been out for many, many years now, and some people are uncomfortable with it, but I don't know of any film that can get you closer to the cross than that one. Now, here's my challenge to you, and I want to get this challenge out right here and right now. These events aren't just about you. It's for your neighbor, your friend that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you right here and right now with as much maximum time as we've got before that event to start thinking about and praying about that person that you would bring to that Friday night service. Now, we've got two facilities now that we can run this. I know you might have seen the movie 10 times, but your neighbor may have never seen it. And I can't think of a better opportunity. And I know it's a rough movie to watch. But it's important to honor Jesus Christ with every effort that we can put out. And I can't think of a better moment to return to our church and historical roots, explain what Monday Thursday is, and then show the passion of the Christ. And then after that, I'm going to have a Q&A. So if people want to ask questions that night, I just want you to know I will be available right up here. Uh, and if anything difficult gets asked, I'll just hand the mic to Todd. He can handle it. But we'll be right here. Passion and Q&A. Then Saturday, and I'm excited. Erin, do you want to take a moment and share the great idea you brought out and something she's working on for Saturday? Okay, well, it's not original, so I can't take any credit. But we're going to do uh, a scavenger hunt called the Hunt for Easter. And it will be around town. And as, it, as each um, 
clue you receive, it, it, it directs you to the word. You'll have to read a bit of the story uh, of the resurrection in order to be able to advance. Um, and so it should be really fun for families to do together. It's COVID safe and should take you a, I don't know, a couple hours in the afternoon, but we'll have some prizes and some good stuff. So that's our, our family offering uh, for the kiddos. So make sure you get, get signed up for that when it comes out and we'll get you the info. Sound good? And then comes the day, Sunday, Easter, three services this year. Now, you might want to write this down, and we're doing that because we anticipate crowds and we want to make sure we're properly social distanced. Again, if I get these times wrong, uh, 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11. So they're, they're not our normal times. So that's why I want you to have them now. We'll get all this out to you. Again, who can you bring that day? The series, Cold Case Christianity. It's a book written by a former FBI agent that went on, the, went on the hunt for Jesus and found him, turning up all kinds of evidence when he looked at it and then proving that Jesus is the Christ. You can read that book. You can probably, I think there might be even a series out on uh, uh, Right Now Media. So check it out. So we're excited. We're excited for the outreach opportunity. We're excited for all of you. Let's celebrate this year. Amen? All right, right now we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and get ready to hear the word. You ready? Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time. Thank you that freedom comes from you, nowhere else. And I thank you that we are free today to worship you. Father, I invite all those who are watching by Facebook to join in this celebration where we study your word. We give you all the praise and all the glory and thank you for all those who have sacrificially given and kept this church not only running but thriving during this pandemic. Now we just offer this time up to you and for all the needs that are out there, Father, irregardless of what they are. Sickness, Father. Marriages. Emotions. Anxiety. Fear. Doubt. Whatever is there, Lord God, you're greater than any emotion, any demonic present in our culture. Father, drive them out by the power of the Holy Spirit and bring healing to your church. Bring salvations, Lord God, and bring revival. And we just give you all the praise and glory and thank you for what you want to do this day. In Jesus' name. And everyone together said... I'm going to ask you to join me in something right now before I begin this message. And uh, Dave and Jana Virgin, if you're listening this morning, if you're home watching, this is for you. Um, Friday I got a call, and um, I don't know how many of you know Amber Virgin, uh, but Amber has been struggling. I don't even know the, the name of the, the condition, but she's had a, a battle in her with a brain and tumors and tumors throughout her body and she's literally been on the edge of life and death for years really from the time I came here 10 years ago 
And we've watched this family struggle unlike any other I've ever seen. And I was invited into their presence yesterday and I spent time with Amber and at the close of my time with her, I, I prayed for her and I'm I just going to say this publicly. God is always in control and trust me, I can't, I've lost count of all the people and the funerals I've done and the people who have lost battles to diseases and that. But I believe in something. And I'll ride this belief all the way. And that is that God still heals. And I will say publicly that I never, ever, ever give up on that outcome. As I prayed for Amber, I kind of left that out of the prayer. I guess because sometimes you get so afraid as a pastor that if you pray that prayer and then it doesn't happen, you feel like a failure. And I remember I was warned by my predecessor. He said, the hardest thing you're going to experience, man, are watching so many people die. He said, it will affect you. But you know, as I got home yesterday, I thought, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not content to watch her just die. And I thought, I want to stand with this family to the very end. And I'm going to ask you to join me right now in a prayer for absolute healing for Amber Virgin. I live by the word of God. The word says, by his stripes we are healed. How many times did Jesus say to somebody that came to him and said, what do you want me to do for you? And he said, they said, heal me, touch me. Now, I have no control over what God's ultimate decision is in this matter, but I can petition him for what I want. The worst he can do is say no to us, right? So we might as well ask, right? So would you join me now in a prayer and a petition for Amber's healing? Will you join me now? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I come before you and I bring my sister who has been suffering for many, many years. And this family, Lord God, has had to spend their life in hospitals and doctor's offices and spend a fortune, Lord. And Dave and Jana have stood in the gap. They have honored you, Father, with their faith. And they have taken care of their beautiful daughter, and they have stood the test of time and have not denied you. And I'm asking you now, Lord God, to rise up against that tumor and to rise up against the disease afflicting her body. And I petition you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to release her from that disease. And Father, for this reason, so that no one can deny that you are Lord. And I give you all the praise and glory. And thank you, Father, that your perfect will will be done. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone together said? Amen. Amen. All right, Daniel 11, here we go. Now, if you'll remember last week, we left Daniel in a very interesting situation, wouldn't you say, if you were here or caught the message? He was visited, or he had a vision of Jesus himself, and it was so powerful, what did it do to a man? He took a header and went out cold, standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. And he gave this description of what he saw, and it's really cool because if you go from Daniel 11 and go over to Revelation 1, and you read Revelation 1, another person, John the Revelator, John the Prophet, John the Disciple of Jesus, gives an almost word-for-word -word exact description of of what he saw in heaven when he saw Jesus. And so you don't have one, but you have two people here giving perfect descriptions. Clothing, eyes, hair, legs, the whole deal. But then, after he came to and needed help and strengthening, God sent an angel to him. And the angel said, I've come to tell you the truth. And he said, but I was with somebody. I was opposing somebody. I was opposing the prince of Persia. You remember when he said that? So we saw that Daniel was in the midst of spiritual warfare. And he said, I'm about to come and I'm about to give you 
these prophecies and this vision. So here's what you need to know about what the angel tells Daniel. Chapter 11, just, a, I don't know, 135 prophecies. That's quite a few, isn't it? Woo! In other words, virtually everything in the book, every word is a prophecy. Covers 375 years. How about that? Now, what it first does is it covers the wars between Greece and Persia. Now, it should make sense to you that if an angel said, I came from wrestling with or fighting with the prince of Persia, and soon the prince of Greece will come, that if there's two spiritual forces called the prince of Persia and the prince of Greece, that in the world there would also be an issue between Greece and Persia. And as we read right away, guess where the wars start? Greece and Persia. Then the book will talk about, I say the book, I mean Daniel chapter 11, will talk about the rise of another leader, a world leader called Alexander the Great. Remember us talking about him? And his empire will be divided into four parts. One, two, three, four, four different divisions. And two of those, one is just simply referred to, if you read Daniel 11, one is called the king of the north, the other one is called the king of the south. And they will go at each other for over 375 years. Can you imagine that? Crazy. Hold on a second. All right. I'll get that later. So, you guys ready? All right. Here's what I want you to see. Remember I said, remember the fill in the blanks. I've said this before. I'm going to say it again and again until you remember this because it will help you understand everything that's going on right now, even in the United States. Number one, the spiritual realm drives the natural realm. I want you to say that with me. The spiritual realm drives the natural realm, okay? But you have a critical role to play in this. Do you remember Daniel was the one praying when the angel came to him? He, he ignited a spiritual battle. Remember that? Now, I'm not going to say every time you pray, that's what happens. But I do find it interesting that over in the New Testament, Jesus gave us a prayer to pray. Have you ever heard this before? If you have, just shout it out. Our Father? I didn't say, say the next line. I just said, <laughs> shout it out if you've heard it before. Have you heard that before? Yeah. Our Father? Or what? All right, I'll stop right there. You just said something so powerful. And this is the problem in the United States. We've reduced this to a nice little Sunday school saying, it's not. It's anything but that. If the Lord gave you a prayer to pray, don't you think it has power and force behind it? These aren't just nice trite words that we hang on a wall and look at from time to time. This is the belt of truth and the sword of the Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven... That's a statement of faith. Hallowed be thy name. I worship you. You alone are God. Then it says what? Thy kingdom come what? Where? When? Stop right there. I just said the natural world is driven by the spiritual world, right? It just came out in the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God has a plan for each person. You have a role to play, amongst which is constant, unending, unyielding prayer. But there's something that determines whether or not the prayer is effective. Did you notice this isn't in my notes? This is what we call the sermon within the sermon. It's a little bonus. All right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us you're trusting him for all your needs. Why? So that you can set yourself aside and pray and not worry about those things. And then here's maybe the key that unlocks the door. Not maybe, it is. Forgive us this day, or give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. Please have a little enthusiasm. <laughs> forgive us our trespasses as what? Does not Jesus say, love your enemy? How do you do that? 
It's impossible, actually. He set it up, though, so that you would have to trust him with that ability. But when you do that, the Bible says this. It gives us a warning. In the book of Matthew, it says, if you won't forgive others their sins, your Father in heaven won't forgive you yours, thus negating the entire prayer. But if you truly forgive others, it says he will forgive you, he'll take care of your daily bread, and he guarantees you that what is written about you in heaven will come to pass in the earth. Now, is that worth pursuing? And I would just say this, Daniel figured this all out by the grace of God before God ever issued the Lord's Prayer. In fact, he walks in it so much, God unfolds the whole future for him because he can be trusted with that. And here's something you should be in hot pursuit of. You want everything that was ever written about you in heaven to happen on earth. Because God has called you and enjoined you into his service of winning the loss to you. I'm not talking about just your career. I'm talking about having a passion for and engaging in spiritual warfare and seeing lives be saved. Amen? That's not even part of the message. Whoa, is this going to be a long one? <laughs> Relax. Take a Xanax and enjoy the rest of the service. Okay? Now... We're going to have to go through this, these 20 verses. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Hang on. Let me see what I got next. All right. Daniel 10, we backed up. I really already covered this. But let me just say this again. We started well with him with an angel. And the angel said something to him. It's interesting because it's where chapter 11 starts. He said, I'm going to reveal you to things from the book of the truth. What's the book of truth? It's not the Bible. It's one of the books written in heaven. The Bible says there's all kinds of books written by God including books written about you. How about that? Do you want to look at that book or are you afraid of it? Don't be afraid of it. Can I just say, don't be afraid of it. It's what God has for you out of his love for you. Okay? But this particular book is all about prophecy. It's a prophetical book of truth. So he says, I'm going to show you truth. Okay? So here we go. Let's look at truth because Daniel 11, 2, where it starts, and you might want to turn over there with your phone. Watch what the angel says. Now then, I will reveal what? I'll reveal the truth to you. So he said back in 10, there's a book of truth. Now I'm going to reveal to you what that truth is. I love truth. It's what really frees us. Okay, now, watch what it says. I'm going to start reading some of these verses to you. Now then, I will reveal the truth to you. Three more Persian kings will reign to be succeeded by a fourth, far richer than the others. He will use his wealth to stir up everyone to fight against the kingdom of Greece. That's verses 1 and 2. Who were they? These are the last four Persian kings. And there are their names right there. We got them. We got them in the history books. Cambyses, Smyrnus, Seleucus, and Artaxerxes. That's the one I want you to remember. He's the last one. He's the wealthiest one. He is married to someone named Esther. Ever read the book of Esther? In the Bible, great, another great book of faith. You want to read one? Talk about a lady champion. Man, it's a beautiful story. Her husband is king, and he will stir up the kingdom of Persia against the kingdom of Greece. When does that take place? Now, this is important. 480 B.C., 56 years after this prophecy is written. So now we're into the future, which no one can yet see. But already things are being written that will take place. This one is 56 years after the Lord reveals this to Daniel. All right? You with me? I'm going to keep checking in on you from time to time because I know it's a lot of information. All right, verse 3. Then a mighty king will rise to power who will rule with great authority and accomplish everything he sets out to do. Wouldn't you love to be like that? Just sets out just everything you do. Right? But at the height of his power, his kingdom will be broken apart and divided into four parts. It will not be ruled by the king's descendants, nor will the kingdom hold the authority it once had, for his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Anybody know who that is? I talked to you just about it a moment ago. Alexander the Great. Now let's look at that description for just a second. He'll conquer and he'll do everything he wants to do. Remember, he did. He con he, in fact, his statement, his most famous statement was this. Maybe you've heard it. There are no more worlds left to conquer. That was him. Who said it? I've, I've done everything. And he did everything he wanted to ever do by the time he was 30 years old. And then he died. Just 
like that. Nobody murdered him as far as he know, but he died. And guess what? He didn't have kids. So without kids, he had no heirs. And what does the prophecy say? It will be divided amongst four others. Who were they? His generals. Okay? Who proceeded to make a mess. This book, the rest of it, from here on out, concentrates on two of those four empires. Okay? And here they are. I want to give you their name. When you hear king of the south, because that's what you'll hear, because Daniel didn't know their names, it's the Ptolemaic dynasty. Boy, I sound like a history professor now, don't I? Okay. If you hear of the king of the north, it's called the Seleucid dynasty. Why these two? Well, as I go forward with this story, you'll see that there's a nation that lies smack between the king of the north and the king of the south. Want to take a guess what that nation is? It's Israel, right smack in the middle. Can I just tell you, everything in Daniel from here on out is Israel-centric. And I'll show you the reason why in just a couple minutes. Okay, now i got to keep you asking this. Are you still with me? Yeah. All right, good. Let me show you a map. Maps are good, all right? Green is the Seleucid Empire. You'll notice, you'll see Seleucia is the word, right? There. Ptolemaic Empire to the south, which is now Egypt. And if you follow, look at their meeting point right in the middle of Israel. And can I just say what's so sad about that? If you're an invading army and you're heading from the south to the north, which way are you going to go? You're going to go right through Israel. If you're an invading army from the north and you go to the south, which way are you going to go? Right through Israel. Bad news. Israel's going to get trampled. Trampled, stomped, invaded constantly. Why? Well, we'll get to that. Let's read a few more verses. You ready? Here we go with the first verse. We're going to go with verse 5. The king of the south, Egypt, will increase in power, but one of his own officials will become more powerful than he and will rule his kingdom with great strength. Some years later, this is verse 6, an alliance will be formed between the king of the north and the king of the south. The daughter of the king of the south will be given in marriage to the king of the north to secure the alliance. But she will lose her influence over him, and so will her father. She will be abandoned along with her supporters. Verse 7, but when one of her relatives becomes king of the south, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and defeat him. Okay. How many of you have ever watched one of those shows like, I don't know... Housewives of Orange County, or something of that nature. Are you ready for the biblical version of this? You want to see this in all of its splendor? Who are we talking about here? It said, verse 6, said the daughter of the king of the south was, this is her, her name, Berenice, not Bernice, Berenice. And she was given, okay, to the king of the north, Antiochus II, and united the two kingdoms. Now let me just say this. Why on earth would your enemy give you his daughter to be married? Anyone want to guess? Marriages produce children. And specifically, if you produce a male child, guess what? You can now have influence in that other kingdom. That's one of the reasons it happens. So it's kind of really a phony alliance. It's really all for political purposes. But can I say this, ladies? Watch what you ladies do in this story. You ready for this? Antiochus married Bernice, but he was already married to a woman named Laodice. Already had a wife, okay? Antiochus divorced Laodice and married Berenice. Antiochus stayed married to Berenice until her father, Antiochus, died. Now there's no more of a political advantage to that marriage, right? So what does he do? He divorced Berenice and remarried Laodice, his first wife. Okay, Laodice had Antiochus murdered, then murdered Berenice and her only daughter. Any of you women mad at your husbands, I'll pray for you. <laughs> and can I just say this? Have you noticed something about human beings? We haven't changed at all, have we? Some people will do whatever it takes to obtain power. Betrayal, overthrow, murder, it's all there. The Bible says there's nothing old or new under the sun. This happened in the year 246 B.C. Now we're 90 years into the future. 
And I just say, when God is accurate, he's accurate. Amen? But all, just, can I just say this? Wouldn't it have been nice if you just, you had a relationship with the Lord and you didn't have to live that way? Through all that political intrigue, betrayal, murder. It's terrible, isn't it? I mean, it really is. Would you like some more good stuff? It's, it's, it's all over this. All right, did I, we were up through verse, uh, we were up through verse 7. Okay, watch this. Okay, when the, let's see, but when one of her relatives, okay, this is Berenice's relative, becomes king of the south, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and defeat him. When he returns to Egypt, he will carry back their idols with him, along with priceless articles of gold and silver. For some years afterward, he will leave the king of the north alone. So here's what happened. Berenice's brother got even. She was murdered, her daughter was murdered, left her nothing. He rose up and went back and defeated the king of the north out of revenge and took all their idols. And in fact, there were idols from the south that he found there, and he said, I'll take all that too. So now he's got all of his idols. What a great family, aren't they? I mean, whoo. I mean, man, it's incredible. Now here at this point, I want to interject a question. Why is God taking all this time to predict the future? Read Isaiah 46, 9 with me. Ready? I am God alone, and there is no one like me. Only I can tell the future before it happens. This is where God separates himself. Write this down. The God of the Bible separates himself from every other God on this point. You look at any other religion, and I've studied world religions, none of them are predictive of the future like this. Oh, there's people who take shots at it. Some of you maybe have read the written writings of like Nostradamus and things like that, but they still get things wrong. God never gets things wrong. That's why it's referred to as the book of truth, okay? Remember this too. Jesus is the one who appeared at the start of this vision, and he will appear again regarding his return in the book of Revelation. He starts it, and he finishes it, Okay? All right, I better ask again at this time. You guys at home, you guys doing okay? You still with me or have you gotten up to get a snack? Okay, stay with me. All right, let's read a little more. Ready? Later, the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south. Here we go again, back and forth, but will soon return to his own land. However, the sons of the king of the north will assemble a mighty army that will advance like a flood and carry the battle as far as the enemy's fortress. Then in a rage, this is verse 11, the king of the south will rally against the forces assembled by the king of the north and will defeat them. So we have this back and forth battle between these two. Here we go. Berenice's brother Tolobe invades the northern kingdom, steals their idols, steals back the idols from the northern kingdom that had stolen from them. And here's a quote. I love this from Pastor Chris Langham in California. If your gods can be stolen, you need a bigger god. Seriously, it's not much of a God, is it? Really, is it? And by the way, those gods haven't done a whole lot of good at bringing any kind of peace, right? We are now, ready for this, 310 years into the future. Now, let me just stop here and make a historical point so that you guys know this. There is, we, can, we've, we can't recover what you would call Daniel's original writing. That's never happened. However, have you guys heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? found in the, caves of, in the caves of Qumran were parts of, many parts of the Bible that were recovered. They are the oldest manuscripts recovered. One of the biggest manuscripts recovered was parts of the book of Daniel. And when they were able to date those manuscripts, they were dated prior to any modern day writing or interpretation of Daniel. Does that make sense? Because a lot of people since the writing of Daniel have said the following, uh, they were just written at a later date. And I believe some people said it was written, I believe they were saying like 70, 80 AD or something like that, and then all of a sudden Qumran comes along, they discover the book of Daniel, and it dates back way back I don't know the exact year that those manuscripts were dated, but it's back into the B.C. era before Christ, thus substantiating the truth of God's word. And by the way, it was written so well, it was written in Hebrew, what they found, 
that they couldn't find any difference between what we've translated through the Septuagint and modern translations, the Greek translation is known as the Septuagint, and what was written on that manuscript. Nothing had changed. Completely accurate. If you're an English teacher out there today, just want you to know the grammar was great. Okay? So that's where we were. I just wanted to throw that in, another bonus for you today. These writings are accurate, and to be honest, if you're going to be an honest archaeologist and an honest historian, they are not in dispute, specifically since their recovery as the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they're on display in Israel right now. You can go and see them, all right? Now, here's a new map. This is a friendlier one. I've got a smiling camel there, so it's a little nicer than the other one. But now these two armies are, are just... Opposed, and right in the middle is this area known as Raphia. That's where the king of the north had set up a great fortress in order to access the king of the south. But now you see Seleucid Empire, Egyptian or Ptolemy Empire. That's a pretty good, it's pretty simple, but that's what the two looked like, okay? With Jerusalem being in the middle. All right, you ready to keep moving? Verse 12, after the enemy army is swept away, the king of the south, Ptolemy, will be filled with pride and will execute many thousands of his enemies, but his success will be short-lived. A few years later, the king of the north, the Seleucids, will return with a fully equipped army greater than before. At that time, there will be a general uprising against the king of the south. Now watch this, because this is a first. There's a hitch here. Violent men among your own people will join them in fulfillment of this vision, but they will not succeed. In other words, for the first time, we now have Jewish soldiers joining the army of the south against the Seleucid Empire. Big mistake, because they lost. And you'll notice the result was thousands of lives lost. And can I just interject something here? I don't think we think about this all the time, but I want to just bring it to your attention. War means battle. Battle means lost lives. Lost lives mean lost souls. Those are souls that never return. And so think about how God feels when people, two families, right? This is just two families. Do you hate somebody this much in your family? I mean, think about this is sheer hatred on a level where you're willing to kill hundreds of thousands over several hundred years. And so far, so far in what I've read to you, what have those kings and their countries gained? Some idols. And by the way, those idols are gods who apparently can't do anything to stop the fighting. You see what I'm saying? What a terrible way to live. Oh, how about a few more verses, right? And let me just highlight this. Ptolemy IV will defeat Antiochus III at the Battle of Raphia in 217 BC. I covered 12 and 13. This predicts the comeback of the north. Verse 14 talks about another Ptolemy. Now we're up to Ptolemy number five. Why do they keep naming it? Can't, can't come up with another name? Ptolemy V, but I said with a hitch, it's the first time Jewish soldiers got involved. And then verses 15 and 16 is about the further conquest of Israel by Antiochus III. Do you guys recognize that name, Antiochus II? You guys kind of know there's, something, there's someone else coming in this bloodline. By the way, Antiochus III was also known as Antiochus the Great because of his great military prowess. Okay, And that's where we are as we hit verse 17. Now watch this. Let me back up and do 16. The king of the north will march onward unopposed. None will be able to stop him. He will pause in the glorious land of Israel intent on destroying it he will make plans to come with the might of his entire kingdom and will form an alliance, oh no, here we go again, with the king of the south and he will give him a daughter in marriage in order to overthrow the kingdom from within, but his plan will fail. So Antiochus III, oh my goodness, can you believe they're going to try the whole marriage thing again? Watch this. Israel would now be under the Seleucid Empire from 200 B.C. to 63 B.C. That's because of that battle. Remember, when the, when the Jewish soldiers joined in with Ptolemy in the south against the king of the north and they lost that battle, it put them under the Seleucid Empire now for more than a hundred, well over 100 years, 130-some years. Verse 17 describes a deceitful alliance between Antiochus' daughter who marries Ptolemy. Her name is... 
Cleopatra. Eh, not the one in the movies. <laughs> it's a different one. Cleopatra was sent to spy, but it backfired, okay? She chose husband over dad. And can I tell you, in any counseling situation, I would say husband over dad. But when it comes to military matters, that's not necessarily the truth, <laughs> all right? Verse 18 is about, it was funny, this guy, Antiochus III, considered great in that, died suddenly. And now it brings, who, guess who? Rome. Do you remember from prior chapters of Daniel how Rome is described spiritually? Not a prince, but a horrifying beast. Remember that? That could, was almost beyond description. It was so hideous. So you can imagine, can you imagine now why Daniel is struggling as much as he is? Let's just take a moment and just summarize this guy, this great man. He suffered 70 years at least of his own exile in a foreign country, made a eunuch. You remember he was thrown into a lion's den after, remember this? Remember, if you think politics is a problem now and there's betrayal now and there's all kinds of things going on and it upsets you, don't you remember what happened to Daniel? Daniel was completely innocent and they said, now we want to get him on his worship. So they made that phony decree. All of Darius's magistrates went to him and said, make a decree saying it's illegal to worship anybody but you. And so he signed off on that and he found out he got betrayed by his own people to put Daniel in the lion's den. By the way, what happened to those who put Daniel in the lion's den? That's right. The very thing that they had prepared for others ended up being victims themselves. And can I just say this? Some of you here right now, you're worried about the future of the United States. You think maybe somehow God... I went, oh man. Ooh, really got me on that one. But I'm going to make a comeback. God's not doing that right now. The Bible says this. Kingdoms will come and kingdoms will go. But the name of the Lord will stand forever. <laughs> Is that an addition to the message or are you listening to someone else do the book of Daniel while I'm doing the book of Daniel to compare notes? By the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, all of a sudden Daniel's becoming real popular. If you go out on YouTube and all that, you've got all kinds of pastors trying to teach and you might hear them say this, yeah, I listened to Tom Redmond, and yeah, this is what he had to say about looking at him. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's do the last couple verses, and then just a couple more points, and then we're done. And you survived. Isn't hey, great? All right. Let's do verse 19. Uh, let's do 18, otherwise it won't make sense. After this, this is after this whole affair with Cleopatra and all that, he will turn his attention to the coastland and conquer many cities. This is Antiochus the Great. But a commander from another land will put an end to his insolence and cause him to retreat in shame. He will take refuge in his own fortresses, but will stumble and fall and be seen no more. In other words, he's going to die suddenly and be off the scene. Verse 20, 21 of the last two. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. But after a very brief reign, he will die, though not from anger or in battle. This is another one of these kind of crazy moments there was a brief ruler that came along that was kind of outside the family. His name was Seleucus IV, and he had this tax collector named Heliodorus. And I won't spend a lot of time, but there's always certain people that try to take control that think they can handle the thing. And this guy, Seleucus, is one of those people. He couldn't handle it. There was no way he could handle running the empire, but he thought what he could do is he thought he could steal money. He thought, man, the empire, you know, wars are expensive. He thought he could steal everything from the, from the treasury in Jerusalem. So he sends his tax collector down there. The tax collector does a dirty deal on it and ends up murdering Seleucus. And so now there's a power vacuum. Antiochus III is gone. Seleucus is gone. Who's going to rule? Well, let's read this last verse, verse 21. The next to come to power will be a despicable man who is not in line for royal secession, that he will slip in when least expected and take over the kingdom by flattery and intrigue. Who are we talking about? Drum roll, please. This is the infamous Antiochus Epiphanes. 
Now, I've already talked about him before, but you'll remember lots of Christians believe he either was the Antichrist or is a foreshadowing of him. Why? He ended up marching into Israel. He marched into Jerusalem. He set up what's called, you've heard the term, the abomination which causes desolation. It was a false idol inside the temple. He stopped all sacrifice. He murdered over 40,000 Jews and declared essentially himself God. Now, the interesting story, and I don't have time to go into this today, but a ragtag group of soldiers under a guy named Judas Maccabeus formed a ragtag army and actually defeated this man with vastly inferior forces. You can read about it in Josephus' book. Uh, the, I believe it's called The Jewish Wars is what it's called. But it would take many years to free themselves from the Seleucid Empire. And by then, how many had died? Now, I said to you earlier, why? Why did so many people have to die? Well, I want you to think about this. Why does God allow so much detail in this chapter? Number one, because he wants you to see how humans behave without him. Life without God is hell. And to prove that point, let's go over to James 4, 1 through 3. Because this answers why all these wars took place. It also answers why there's a lot going on right now. Amen? With me? Hang in there. We're almost done. James chapter 4, verse 1. What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. Isn't that what we just had? For more than 375 years. Do you think in 375 years they might figure out that this wasn't working? You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You want it all for pleasure. And so clearly God writes all of this out in detail to show you what man is going to do to man when he's not walking with God. So, why is America acting crazy right now? Because we've rejected the ways of God. There's no other answer for it. People right now are scheming. You go out on the, on the, you go out on the internet. You go out on social media. There's no truth out there. Good luck. Watch the media at night. I don't see any truth. But you know what? Here's what I also know. I'm not worried about it. And the reason I'm not worried about it is because kingdoms will come and kingdoms will go. But the word of the Lord will remain forever. Amen? Amen. Now, there's another reason, and you need to see this. We just celebrated what big holiday? This is my final point, and then we're going to be done. I'm going to get out of here because I'm hungry. Why does Satan stir up so much war? Read Revelation 1.8 with me. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning from the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who? The one who? And? Now, what happened just prior to Jesus being born. Now, I'm, I'm getting my history wrong. It was after he was born. What happened not long after he was born, within two years after he was born? Herod ordered the murder of babies, right? One of the names for Satan is a liar and a murderer. So we know that the spiritual realm was driving what? You guys got it right. I give you guys an A, first church service, C+. Plus. Okay, they did fair with that. But do you see now, do you see the connection between the spiritual and the natural? Now, back in Daniel's day, why was God revealing all of this? Because Jesus hadn't come the first time. The one who was. He had not yet come to earth. But yet Daniel was shown everything right up until the last day. And say it will be opposed. His opposition was going to be there when he arrived the first time by Satan, and it's going to be opposed when? Right 
now before his second coming. So if you want to know why there's so much insanity in our culture, and it's not just our culture, it's what's going on around the world right now. There's more going on in Israel than in any other time in its history. Prophecy is being fulfilled. History is being made, and you're supposed to play a role in it. And so I ask you this morning, where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Those of you at home, where are you? Are you sitting back and watching and saying, that's a nice service. I really enjoyed that. <laughs> or are you saying, no, I want to take a stand. I want to be right with you, Jesus. I want to ask you for forgiveness. I want my prayers to be heard. I'm aware that there's a spiritual war going on and I want to participate in it because I want to see your will be accomplished in my personal life, in the life of the church, and in the life of my nation until you return. Amen. Sound like one of those old-fashioned preachers now. <laughs> the days are on us. If you can, I, just get up in the morning. When you see deception, when you see wars and rumors of wars, when you see persecution, when you see all these things, Jesus said, don't look down, look up. So there shouldn't be one person here that's down this morning. You should be up and looking up and saying, man, God, you were right then in Daniel's day and you're right right now. Amen? Amen. I'm going to click this. I don't think I have another point. Oh, I do. Oh, good. <laughs> Satan hates God's plan of salvation. He hates it. Do you understand with all the wars and everything going on, he hates salvation because salvation means save lives rather than lost ones. Right? Jesus was opposed the first time and he'll try to stop him the second time. Amen? That's what you're seeing. The spiritual world which opposes the second coming of Jesus is what's going on right now. Can I ask you at this moment, man? I'm going to ask you one of two questions. And I'm asking you who are watching by Facebook. How many of you can honestly look God in the eye? Not me. Can you look him in the eye and say... I have a personal relationship with you. If you were like Daniel and all of a sudden Jesus showed up, where would you be? Would you really know in your heart that you could have a conversation with him because you knew you were one of his? Or would you be utterly terrified beyond words because you knew you didn't belong to him and you knew your time was up? And if you're a Christian this morning and maybe you've looked at the world around you, you've gotten discouraged and you've gotten down, this is not the time to feel that way. The wonderful word of Jesus Christ. Go read Matthew 24. He told us how it was going to be at the end. And nothing that I see surprises me. Nothing that I see is catching me off guard. The only thing I have to do, though, is be calm, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and never stop praying. And pray with right motives. Amen? If you have never turned your life over to Jesus, I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray you'll accept him in your heart. I want to pray that you will ask forgiveness for your sins. And I'm going to ask him to fill you with his spirit. Right now, here and at home, hear my prayers. Lord Jesus... I'm sorry that I have lived a sinful life. I'm asking you now to forgive me, to take my sins and wash them away. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Will you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that one day I can stand in front of you and be sure of my salvation. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into my life. I repent 
and turn from my wicked ways. And I'm now trusting in you. In the wonderful name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone together said, if you said that prayer today, would you please let us know so that we can pray with you. Those of you at home watching by Facebook, let us know. We want to hear from you. Thank you guys. God bless you.